Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another edition of uh, Roundtable with Selectman Mike O'Donnell. And tonight my guests are uh, Paul Johnson, candidate for uh, Board of Selectmen, and Mr. Jack Franey, uh, candidate for re-election to the uh, town treasurer's position. Before we get into our discussion tonight, though, I would ask that everybody in the uh, studio and everybody in the audience at home, please join me in a minute of silence for the victims of the tragedy in Boston at the marathon. And a uh, moment of silence, please. We got to have mercy on their souls. Um, that was a... Uh, horrific event um, that doesn't need any explanation from me. It's been on the news enough, certainly. Uh, there were uh, individuals from Carver that were up there. Fortunately, uh, um, none of them were hurt, uh, seriously. Um, but uh, I would ask you to please keep the um, families of the victims um, in your thoughts and prayers and the victims themselves, the survivors that are uh, currently in the hospital. So. Thank you very much, and God bless them. Tonight, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the program, I have two guests, Mr. Paul Johnson and Mr. Jack Franey. And what I want to do is I want to ask uh, them to both introduce themselves, give us a little um, of their background, and discuss what their, uh, what their visions are and what their goals are um, and why they're seeking these positions. Um, I'm going to start with Mr. Paul Johnson. Paul, welcome. Mike. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. Uh, my, my background, a, a lot of people know me as the advocate for affordability in town. I've been doing, advocating for affordability since uh, roughly 1998, 1999. Uh, I've come to uh, have an in-depth knowledge of the, the financing in town of Cava through that work. Uh, I've trolled on the Department of Revenue's website for a, a number of different statistics and and things that uh, would make a person knowledgeable in what they're talking about when, they, when it comes to affordability, why Carver is on the path that it's on, what, what's happened in the past and where we're going in the future. Uh, had an opportunity in 2009 to get on the Water Commission to start to try to make a difference for the town of Carver. It's, it's one thing to be critical, it's quite an, another thing to be able to offer effective alternatives. And I always believe that if somebody's going to be a, a critic of what's going on, you'd better be prepared to offer effective and incredible alternatives to, to things like that. Uh, so they got on the Water Commission and I began looking into things that were going on in the Water Commission, the financing of it, uh, and came up with a couple of uh, effective alternatives. The, the first being the way they had structured the financing for the CPA, uh, paying for the million dollars that the CPA had committed over 10 years ignored the, the interest carrying cost of the bond. Uh, I got to work, I sat down with a pencil and a piece of paper and figured out what that interest carrying cost was. It was a quarter of a million dollars. Uh, put together a CPA project that went through and the taxpayers of the town of Carver are, are now uh, unburdened to the tune of $255,810 for my work and my advocacy on their behalf. As the chairman of the North Carver Water Commission, I've been concerned right from the day I stepped onto the commission about the, uh, the condition of the financing of the district. Uh, when, when I got on board with the district, there was really no plan of how they were going to, going to affect betterments and pay for the, the borrowing that they had done. Uh, I have a habit of looking into the detail uh, on things, and I downloaded every single law that impacted uh, chapter 124, which was an ena enabling legislation for the district, and found out that they couldn't better people that were already on the line. That took out a huge chunk of people, and, and with it, a huge chunk of our uh, the, of the district's financing. Uh, we were able to work through that with, with the residents up in North Cava. Uh, through the betterment process, everybody, the, the problem with the bettering people in the district is everybody had to be bettered in order to meet the constraints of state law which says that you can't treat one property any different than you treat another. So the residents had to be, had to go through the betterment process. But I said when I got on the commission that I was going to listen and I was going to make my judgments based on state law and based on fact. And at the end of the day in the betterment process, the residents had pretty well proven that they were not 
increased in value and therefore under state law had to be abated to zero. Abated to zero means that, that they didn't have to pay any charges for the, for, for the water that they were getting. That worked out great from the perspective of one property owner next to another property owner were then treated equally. Neither the person that had been previously hooked up or the new one uh, were better. But from financing the district, it didn't work out very well because what it did is it took all that money away from us. Uh, at the end of the day, we've been able to hook up a, a number of uh, properties. We've been able to bring on uh, the Dunkin' Donuts at KGI. We've been able to bring on uh, Cornerstone Plaza. Uh, we're working with uh, Carver Realty uh, to, to get that end of the pro project developed. And we're still short money. Uh, the district is still not able to meet all of its obligations. So what, what we did is we reached out to Deacus Cranberry and got a deal with Deacus Cranberry to, that's going to bring in between forty dollars and $80,000. Those are the kind of creative, out-of-the-box thinking that, that, that come from nothing but good old-fashioned hard work. You talk about the marathon. I ran the Boston Marathon. Uh, I, I completed it twice. Uh, and, and I know what it's like to have to make a commitment to do things that are difficult. And to, in order to do things that are difficult, you just have to keep plugging. You have to keep, keep doing your research. That's what I bring to the district. That's what I, what I did while I was on the district, and that's what I want to bring to the Board of Selectmen. I want to I keep plugging for the people of Kava to make sure that when we come to you with a project, that we come to you with a minimal cost project, the project that is the best that we can bring. When, when we do the school project, I want to see to it that we've wrung every nickel out of it before we ask the taxpayers of this town for an increase. The taxpayers of Kava have been through a lot. And we, we need not put them through any more than we absolutely have to this time. Well, I think it's incumbent upon us to do the due diligence and look at every facet of any project to make sure that we are acting in the best interest of all the taxpayers and not just a few. Uh, so I agree with you on that. Uh, let me jump over to Jack for a minute. And uh, Jack, uh, you're running for re-election to uh, Treasurer, also a member of the Board of Selectmen, so that uh, we can put that out there for the mm -hmm. public. Um, and I'm sure everybody's fully aware of that. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and qualifications? Well, you know, I'm a certified <coughs> public accountant. I have 39 years of experience in uh, accounting and municipal finance. And I have a bachelor's degree, but what I've accomplished, I've tried to improve the operation of the treasurer collector's office in the past six years. And some of the things I encountered was um, the interest rate that they charge taxpayers, it's by law, uh, it's 14% for outstanding taxes, and then once it's turned over to the treasurer's side, it's 16%. So I crafted a bylaw and put it in place that would, if people come in and pay their tax title, we can cut that interest in half down to 8%. It's unique in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, but it's something that will benefit our taxpayers. Uh, the other thing is I want to, we want the quarterly billing that help with our cash flow and our cash balances. When I was first in, we had to borrow five or six times just to meet our cash flow needs. Uh, with going to quarterly billing, that brings in the money much quicker and we don't have to wait for the DOI to uh, approve anything. We can do it with our local assessors. That brings the money in. So in that, coincidentally enough, helped boost our uh, bond rating up three levels, the double A minus. Um, Does that uh, reduce our expenses on borrowing money also? Yeah, we don't really need to borrow any money because okay. we have plenty. We have probably six, seven, eight million dollars at any one time in our coffers. Well, we didn't really have very much of anything because we, it was taking a long time for the assessors to get the board of, uh, to get the DOI to approve the tax rate. And sometimes they wouldn't approve it until November or December. But equally more important was they had this 3% discount program where they'd allow people to take the discount right then and there. And even though it was 3%, when you really figured it imputed the real interest rate, it could be seven, eight, nine percent. So what we did was went back to the original intent that it should have been done at, and they paid in the first quarter, and that gives me a lot of money to pay for um, the uh, retirement assessment all at once, and we save about $40,000 a year with that. Um, so it benefits the taxpayers? It and does. It, and it benefits the town also? Exactly, and we pay out about 51000 So it's a little bit, It's I figure it's more of an offset, and the people, uh, what happens is that they don't get credit on that until a subsequent year's taxes. That's the way it should be. But not only that is, they were having, a lot of taxpayers were having a very difficult time calculating it. If you miss it by a dollar, you don't get the discount. So I put a um, home rule petition in front of town meeting and 
tracked it all the way through the legislature, and now I can print the amount right on the tax bills. It's calculated by a preset formula that I put in four times uh, quarterly taxes from the prior year plus two and a half percent. They paid that amount. They're going to get the, they're guaranteed to get the three percent on that. Mike, one of, the, one of the things that I see as a taxpayer, that those kind of attention to detail and attention to things that can become traps for a taxpayer. If he misses it by a dollar, he misses the 3% discount program, yet he's paid essentially the entire bill. Right. Those are great things that a public servant can do when they have the background and the education to play in the game. I think the other thing that Jack's done that I appreciate from being in the private sector, when one of our departments ha has a problem. We have to we have to run and we have to help them out because when you're a for-profit agency, it doesn't care why you have a problem. It's that you have, a, in the the analogy that I always use is my stockroom uh, operation is a separate department from mine, but it impacts mine. If they're behind, I'm behind, right. and I can't be efficient. So when when he needs help, nobody has to ask. He gets one of my guys automatically. They just go over and do 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 the work. Jack's done the same type of thing on the quarterly billing. Right. That was an extra imposition of work for Jack. And well, that was, a, that was a big additional workload for your department, right? It was because what happened was uh, people would come in and want us to calculate it. We could help them with it, but it had no bearing on us. But even though they, if they missed it by a dollar, they'd be coming in, well, you calculate it. Well, there's no rule of law that covers you on that, and they'd be upset at it. And, you know, rightfully so, they don't understand. But so it took the burden off my, uh, off my staff and also took the burden off, off the, the taxpayer. taxpayer. Yeah. So everyone was happy, and they knew that's the amount. In, it was built in there. That's all. As long as you paid that amount, you're going to get the 3%. Don't buy, try and spend another $10,000 on there and try and capitalize on it. Make another 3%. Right. That's not going to work for you. So the taxpayers win, and, and the, the town of Cobble won also on that. That's, that's right. Win. And, and don't forget the quarterly billing. That, that was the same thing. It was right. more work for his department, sure. an understaffed department stepping up to the plate and doing something to improve the cash flow for the entire town so that we didn't have to go out and borrow. Right. But I, I've also done things outside the box. I noticed no money was coming in from the Council on Aging. They run two programs down there, transportation and the food program, and no monies were coming in at all. So I went to work on there, and I was able to find out why the money wasn't coming in. It was going into a separate account at Mutual uh, Federal Savings Bank under someone else's name. So I was able to stop that. And now the um, money is being used to fund the transportation project and the, the food cost. Not only that, on the transportation projects, that was a grant, and the grant required any money that you collected to be paid back to them. Now, if it had gone on a number of years and hadn't been paid in, we might have lost that grant. We got about $10,000 a month to cover the cost of the drivers, the bus, and all the operations of it. That would have been a big service that we would have lost. And it was only like a couple thousand dollars a month. And so now that money goes right in there and it gets paid back to the state. So you saved us from losing a benefit for our mm -hmm. senior citizens. Yes. Could and have also, impacted them really negatively. Also the money's going in and subsidizing the food costs for the people down at the Very council good. on aging. So. On a personal note, Jack, uh, when you went to school, you were married, had a family, paid your way through school? I did. Did you go nights? I went nights, I'd borrow the money at the beginning of the semester, pay so much a week, and at the end of the semester, I'd have it paid off and I'd have to start all over again. But I built a great credit rating from that. Yeah. So, but, uh, but you learned, yeah. too, because you had to pay for it yourself and you mm -hmm. appreciated it and everything that you well, had. Well, the other thing was going at night time, you meet usually practitioners in the field instead of just people that are in academics. You get real life experiences from people that you're going to and right. that added to the value of my education I've lived. You know? I, I can second that one. I, I went to school nights and I had the exact same experience. I was going to flip that to you, Paul. Sure. I know you have a degree in operations management yeah. and you know you can tell by the, the way you present your cases for the various issues that you've um, um, been involved in in town, uh, that operations management background, it's analytical research. And when you come to an issue, you come prepared, and you know what you're talking about. And uh, you say you went to school nights too, and, and did the same thing. I right? went to school nights, and and, and the, it's a world of difference. Yeah. You know, and not only not only does going to school nights uh, pre prepare you better, you you you're in with a different 
group of people, generally professionals that are, that are already working somewhat in the field. But the other thing you do, it, it's a time management exercise. Sure. It's, it's how, how you learn to prioritize what you do because you're a full-time person, you have a job, you have commitments, and you have to go to school nights and you have to, you have to learn how to manage your time. I found that to be one of the most beneficial parts of going to school nights. And an inter interesting side note is I was working at Stone, I was going to school at Stonehill and working at the Brockton Hospital. So when I wanted to study on my break and stuff, I'd go up in the medical library. There'd be all sorts of interns and medical staff up there doing their study, and I'd be up there studying my, uh, and they'd be asking me tax questions about how to do your taxes. So. Well, Jack, you mentioned some of your accomplishments uh, um, since you've taken over the reins as the treasurer. You've mm -hmm. You're coming up on the end of your second term, and uh, you're running for a third term. Um. One of the more recent ones, if I might just interrupt you a minute, was I um, intercepted a deal that they were trying to make with Ravenbrook Landfill where they were uh, taking $50,000 off the carrying cost and going to give them an interest-free loan for five years. And was I was able to get involved and restore the 50000 and put it under the 16%, like I mentioned before, that's not available to businesses. So as a result of that, over the next five years, we'll be getting back 358,000 versus 180. So it's a savings or additional revenue to the town that would have been lost of $170,000. Um, sitting around the table was a, a lot of appointed town officials and that was one of my contentions. And go, bringing this position to an appointed position is that people need to have defined responsibilities in uh, details that they have to pay attention to. Those other two people sitting around that should have known better, the uh, assessor and the town accountant, probably didn't have the ability to speak up. But if they have some rules put in place, they'll feel comfortable doing that. So their job won't be in jeopardy. Well, my, my concerns and one of the reasons why we're talking about some of these things that I know that uh, your opponent, um, you know, I haven't really figured out what her platform is yet because mm -hmm. she hasn't really presented any kind of a vision as to what she wants to do in the office or anything. And my concern is that without a background in accounting, without a, uh, an in-depth background in finance, um, that uh, she is woefully ill-prepared mm -hmm. to deal with the complex formulas and mathematics and equations uh, and the complex business deals that emanate from your office and mm -hmm. you're tasked with supervising and overseeing. And would she have been able to pick up on this lost well, $170,000? Believe it or not, treat? she supplied the information from my office unbeknownst to me to them and they acted on it. I, I don't think she'd be, I don't think she yeah. really realized what was going on here. So it might have just gone through, it's just I happened to be going into the selectman's office and those gentlemen that were there from Ravenbrook and I struck up a conversation with them. And right. Since I was a member of the board of selectmen, I was able to invite my way into that meeting. I don't think they were going to tell me right. I couldn't attend where I was a member of the board of selectmen. I guess my point is, though, that this is not a position where you can OJT, on-the-job training. No. I mean, we're talking about a $32 million corporation and you're running the financial end of that mm -hmm. business. The town of Carver is a business. That's right. Okay, it's a municipal business, yep. but it's a business nonetheless, yep. and it's a and, and it's a very complex one. From, you know, various leasing deals to capital plans, uh, you name it. Um, you know, you have to be. Shot. Speaking of the leasing deals, uh, you got to speak the language yeah. too. Yep. I mean, uh, town accountant's been going out and getting leases, and he's paying eight, nine, ten percent interest in that when we can do short-term borrowing at a half of one percent. One and of the so problems. Money one of the problems, Mike, that you you see uh, in, in in this issue here, is that underqualified people tend to focus an inordinate amount of their time and energy on the day-to-day -day grunt work that's in an office, that they see as important to them from their perspective, and you can understand that. Sure. One of the one of the one of the advantages of being one of the gray-haired people that, that's around is you have years of experience behind you that allows you to be able to focus the effort of yourself and other people on making long-term improvements. You can never forget as a manager that your goal is, is that of a change agent. 
somebody that needs to have vision for where the department wants to go and how to get there. Right. You can't have an, an inward focus on the day-to-day -day operations. You have, to, tasks, right, right. you have to be able to say, how do I make it better for the town? Well, how has Jack made it better for the town? He's done the quarterly billing. He's, he's taking care of a, a problem on, on uh, the Ravenbrook landfill. The, the Ravenbrook landfill. They're covering $170,000. Right. For Those are not small right. accomplishments. Those are big ticket accomplishments right. that, that pay for his salary. Sure. In my job, I have to be able to pay for my salary through improving the operation of my departments. W what assumptions that somebody at the, uh, you know, that's, uh, that doesn't have the education and experience has is radically different from somebody that's got the gray hairs, who's been a manager and has been around. Sees the big picture. Right. The as, big as, picture is terrible. As opposed important. to the narrow focus, like you said. And, and, and that's not trying to belittle anybody. No. Uh, because, Jack, you've, uh, you've said that your uh, opponent does a fantastic job in that little sphere of operations that you said. Yeah, that's, that's the assistant treasurer's yep. position. It's been a, a gap in our operations, and she's contributed towards that, and I have as well. And I identified that, you know, we need to refill that with, you know, a part-time position, not the full-time that they cut out of there. You know, maybe their intent was to cut it back to make up for that, but they shouldn't need it to uh, cut the whole position out of there because it hurt the operation. Uh, in 2003, they brought in about the, in the audit that the reconciliations were behind and so were the cash receipts posters. And this is prior to you assuming now. Yes, yeah. and they cut, you know, that's when my you know, predecessor was there. They cut a full-time position out. That's not the type of reaction you do. You try and supplement it with some additional help, not reduce the help. Well, I think, I think the problem with that is that having the office understaffed by that, that amount takes Jack's time away from doing what he should be doing and moving the town forward. When we look at where the town is now, with the third highest tax rate in Plymouth County, commercial tax rate, uh, we have residents that are taxed to the max, and they know it, and they've, they've put the brakes on. So we have to figure out how to get out of this. How do we direct the town? How do we move the town in the right direction? That's what the job of the people at the top of these departments is. It's not to do... A, a, cash reconciliation ABC. It, it's to get that done and, and to move the town forward on things. That's and, what and part of also the job is the proper debt management management. Because of debt management you need to stay on top of the capital needs. That's that's pretty much a definition under the DOR that my position should be involved in that. But yeah, you're right, I'm, I'm taken back by doing these little jobs here, not that they're little people, it's an important Well, routine too, daily they, tasks, right. But they don't have the training and, and the experience right. that I have. I shouldn't be wasting my, my resources, me, in that area. Right. There. And You, you know, need to be working on the strategic goals. Either, you know, the, either the administration couldn't or wouldn't give me that part-time position because right. I've seen in other areas they've given it to people. But, you know, I, I think I'm just equally as important as anyone else. But I've gone along and, and done the work as... You've been a team yeah, player. Exactly. Right. right. You know, uh, Paul, along those lines, as far as, uh, you know, bottom line, you're in the private sector. Um, there is no forgiveness in the private sector for not adhering to the bottom line. No, there isn't. No, you either do your job and you do it within the budget and resources that you're given, or they find somebody else to do it. I always like to say that, that you know, if, if, if I didn't, if, if the iron didn't go out the back end of the door, they'd, they'd scrape the name off the door in a heartbeat. <laughs> but, uh, you know, having said that, what I wanted to do is segue into the school issue, mm -hmm. the, big, the biggest issue, obviously, on the, on the front burner for all of us at mm -hmm. this point in time. And um, what, what is your vision, Paul? We'll start with you. We need to recognize that we have problems at the school. Uh, I've always recognized that. Back when, back when we had the police and fire station override, I was one of the ones questioning what are the needs of the school. And, and one of the things that I didn't like is that nobody could answer the question. Nobody could tell me, well, when do we need to do the school project? It was like, let's get this one approved and then we'll deal with the, the, the school afterwards. And I don't like those kind of surprises. The people of Cava deserve to have a straight up uh, honest comparison as to what their alternatives are, what's coming down the road. We need a financial roadmap. We, we've done a good job on rolling stock. I mean, you can't criticize everything in town. They've done a good job on the rolling stock, the, the police cruises and things like that, uh, in terms of planning for it. But they've missed the ticket on the big ticket things that, that, that have wound up croaking us. Uh, and the school is one of them. We, we basically have what, what amounts to a third world school. 
in a town like Cobb where it's not acceptable. How is that going to hurt the taxpayer? In the long run, if we have to pick up it, it repair expenses on our own nickel, 100%, it's going to hurt the taxpayer. So it behooves everybody to step up to the table and to figure out what we need to do to get this done in an affordable manner. Because from the school's perspective, the taxpayers have already said that they're not going to approve something they don't believe is affordable. Three times. Three times. And not once, not twice, but three times. Right. And that's a pretty tough... Well, what I'm detecting from your comments is that we need to sit down collectively, the leadership and management of the town, and work together to either compromise and come together with some kind of a plan that's palatable for the average taxpayer, understanding the economic environment and circumstances out there at this time in, in, in our lives. Um, but, but I'm not hearing that from the opposition. I don't hear any kind of a plan from the opposition. And in fact, what I see is um, I see foot dragging and I see the, uh, an inability to work as a team to get things done, i.e. the vote to uh, reduce the CPA. That was out of the box thinking, saying, hey, look, let's take a little bit of a burden off the taxpayer with the CPA. We've got plenty of open space. We've done a lot of major projects. Let's reduce that for a while and take that tax money and transparently use it for or towards the school. Right. That way there, it might be a little more palatable to the average taxpayer if it reduces his, his hit. Right. If the CPA is an offset that allows, it, it's an offset to a tax increase is what it would be, uh, because we can't a actually per se take that money and put it into the schools uh, the way things are structured, but it would be an offset that would make the school project more affordable for people. What's wrong with that? Wh what's wrong with saying that, look, we we've, we've done a number of projects on CPA, let's put a moratorium on it for a while and let's come back at that later when we think maybe state aid comes back and makes it a little bit more affordable. Uh, just to continually push the same project on people is it wears on them. They sure. think that people aren't listening. It's disrespectful too. Right. I mean, I spoke up at the 2012 town meeting uh, and, and when we were talking about the Ravenbrook landfill and it, it was, was quoted in the Carver Reporter and I said that that money can go to the school project. Mm -hmm. It should go to the school project. These Any are, solar project should be. Right. Should right. be going to the town, town building uh, stabilization right. fund. We, we, we need to identify yeah. new growth monies and we need to make sure that they go into that capital building stabilization fund so they can't be used for anything else. And we keep our capital building projects Because up. what people don't realize is that's even though it's a 20-year uh, contract that we have with the solar companies, it's one-time revenue. Right. It's not recurring revenue that's matching recurring expenses. Right. So you're absolutely right, right in that regard. Right. And, and the, the, problem, the problem that you, you come up with it is if we put it into operations, you get, you, you get a second kickback at that. Once you put it into operations, it goes disproportionately towards labor. Labor comes back as unfunded pension liabilities, unfunded health care liabilities, which are a huge problem in sure. that we have to address. So if we take that money and put it into the school project itself, then we use a one-time revenue for a one-time expense, and we're not building up our unfunded health care and pension liabilities. You have to understand the nuances of municipal financing in order to know how these things impact the taxpayer. In, it, it's, uh, you know, the, I've, I've said it in front of the Board of Selectmen, and I was corrected by my colleague to the <coughs> left of me, uh, that, and I thought it should be embraced by a lot of people in town, not, by, not win by one vote. And if you look at the original Proposition two and a half, Barbara Anderson was very, very, very smart in getting this thing advanced, plus with all her team of people that helped to do it. It used to be, in order to have a two and a half overrided debt exclusion, you needed two thirds of the vote for it to pass. And that was to involve the whole community, and then they went back to just the simple majority. My contention is that we need, in order for people to be behind us, we need, and I think you've said it, Paul, 60%, right. you know? We, we need, need to a reach. Lot more people. We need to reach out because in the first phase, when you go through it and people have to vote and they don't actually have to open their wallets, there's there's there, there's going to be losses. There are going to be people that say, "Oh yeah, I'll do it," when there's no price sure. tag associated right. with it. Then you're going to lose those people. So you do need to go into that with a, a good, right. healthy 60 percent. Well, we all need to be unified when we present this and sell this to the public, and I think that if that's the case, it'll be accepted instead of somebody trying to ram it down their throat, right. in which case they're going to say no again, you know what I mean? But what disturbs me is uh, uh, your opponent. I, I don't hear any suggestions. I don't hear any recommendations 
proposals for solutions. All I hear is that, you know, I support a school, and that's it. We all support right. a school. We all support right. a school. Right. That's, that's to, correct. It, it has yeah. to be meaningful to people. Right. And you have to be able to help. All right. Tell me how you with, support the school. That's what I want to hear. Yeah. Using right. the building stabilization fund, the money, more and more money will go in every year. And right. What people don't understand is the first year of new growth, that amount of new growth will come in every year. Right. And then it builds like building blocks. You, so you know, one of the, the higher it goes, right. the lower the cost will be to the taxpayer because you can use right. that to offset until it comes almost down to zero. One but of the you problems give people that we have, for that. one of the things that we have, the problems that we have as, as people are that we talk about financing. We talk about making the project uh, affordable. We talk about bonds. We talk about overrides. We talk about underrides. One of the things that we haven't done as good a job articulating is that we are for the kids too. Uh -huh. Because there's only one way to get that project through, and that's affordably. Anybody who's watched the town of Cava go through this process on the schools knows that the, that, that the approach that we've used the last three times isn't right. It's not going to get us to where we want to be. So th those people that are out there that want a school have to learn and have to, they have to do some adapting. They have, to, they, have, they, they have to be as creative as we are. We have to get good at saying to the people, we can, we're concerned about the kids. I've been in youth sporting activities uh, since the mid-1990s. When my kids got out of baseball, that's when I got in. You know, and I enjoy working with kids. I don't want those kids in a, in, in a, a subpar school. Well, it comes down to an affordability act. The superintendent right. of schools says 22 percent of the children in the school system are on free or reduced lunches. And that's because their parents are hurting. And 22 percent, that's a huge number. Right. You know, and those people there, you know, they probably can't afford a tax increase. But if they knew that we had a plan in place that maybe it will cost them a little bit at the beginning, but then it will come down each and every year. And we have to put something in place that will make us adhere to that. Right. You don't want them to get their school and then all of a sudden forget about the funding of that whole concept right. to do it. Because know. back in 88 when I was around when the new high school came on board, they told us it was going to go up $100. My tax bill went up $700, and I don't live in an elaborate house. Right. You know, I, I, I don't want people to think that, uh, that, you know, we're just talking and trying to please some, somebody to get elected. You know, they, nothing could be further from the truth. No. I intend to be a tough negotiator for affordability. It, it is what the people of Carver define it to be. I don't know what that number is. It bothers me that we don't that we've never reached out and asked. That's a survey that we probably should have taken instead of sure. wasting sixteen thousand dollars on this last survey that we had. That, sure. uh, I'd like I, to I, see. I I'd I, like to see it done at an election where people can do it in in the privacy of the voting. Put it on the ballot. With, yeah. Without a campaign on either side. Let's let's just let people vote their conscience on the schools. Well, yeah. Is it a hundred? Is it two hundred? Is it fifty cents? I don't know. I'd like to know what that number is. But you know something. If I, if if I'm a citizen out there, taxpayer, I want somebody to represent me that has a vision, has a plan, and is willing to work hard. And, and I don't hear that from a number of the candidates. You know, I'm hearing it from right. you. Jack has an in-depth understanding from, of it, and he's, mm -hmm. he's supportive of, of the affordable approach, um, you know, the compromising approach. Uh, but, uh, you know, because there are people that aren't willing to do that, um, you know, it's really divided the community uh, to the point where it's, there's a lot of animosity Right. Uh, over this issue. Well, it's, it's exciting to me, this whole concept of the building stabilization fund, and there's other aspects to it. But uh, So I'm kind of a little bit excited that we have a plan that we can put in place that might become a model of every town across. Sure. You know, because Absolutely. I did talk to a selectman from another town, and he said, that's a great idea. Do you right. mind if I use that in front of our board of selectmen? So, yeah. you know, it's we can finally get a, get a school going that we need to do, but we have to keep adhere to that whole concept. All right. We finally got something we can get Jack excited about. There we go. There we go. <laughs> well, listen, um, I think we pretty much um, got the point of view on the school and uh, what your approaches are, what your visions are, um, how, you, how you think we should uh, tackle the problem. Um, so what I'd like to do is I'd like to move over into uh, this latest um, issue that has cropped up in town is the uh, solar projects. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the uh, clean energy and, and the green communities. And just get your thoughts and ideas on that. And uh, Paul, again, why don't I start with you? <clears throat> this is one area that I don't, uh, I, I don't mince any words. The basic 
fundamental premise behind zoning is to separate land uses. Industrial land uses are separate from residential land uses. Should be, should always be, we should never violate that. Somebody who bought their home in a residential area is entitled to protection from encroachment by industrial projects. Solar, whether you like it or not, is an industrial use if it's not designed to be used on the individual's homeowner or homeowners. I've been over to the Great Meadow area. There's only one way to describe what's been done to these people. Their, their, their homes have been destroyed. A large piece of their uh, personal wealth has been taken away from them, and, and it, ha it isn't right. It should never have happened. The zoning, uh, the, the, the zoning board should never have approved, approved that project. They were wrong for having approved it. I don't apologize for, having, for, for saying that. I'm not against all solar. The, the yardstick that I use when I'm talking about solar or alternative energy is the same as I approach any other business. Is it properly sited? Is it financed properly? And is it good for the town of Cava? If it can meet those three tests, then I'll approve it. I approved and I wrote a letter in support of the Ravenbrook landfill uh, solar project. That's properly sited. It's zoned properly and it's good for the town of Cava because it, it recovers the use of, a, of an otherwise useless piece of property. Uh, I was against the solar project on Route 44. That project was uh, very thinly financed. Uh, the original backers, Waterline, backed out right. because they couldn't, right. couldn't see so it. You were, so you were right to, in the beginning there. We, yes. Yeah. And, and that's, a, that's a tough call. When you spend $200,000 in governmental subsidies to generate maybe, maybe $60,000 in savings over 20 years, and, and th that's a big maybe. They don't know if they'll meet those numbers. I think the original uh, assessment was someplace between five and seventy, with, with, and they, they estimate it's going to be and, sixty. And I had the same concerns on the board of selectmen, and I tried. You know, here I am, a financial expert, and I'm giving my call on that. And I know Mike, you agree with me, but the other three selectmen didn't. And what happened? It fell apart. They didn't listen to me. You know, and right. uh, now we another company stepped into this place, but. You know, who knows how that's going to pan out. Maybe. But you have managed to keep their feet to the fire, Jack, mm -hmm. as far as the monies that were promised yes. and for um, the, the fees for dissolving that in the event that that happens and everything and protecting the... Because I've required cash surety. Right. You know, they want right. to give you a letter of credit or a bond. Well, we saw with BATG how much a bond... What happened with that, there. yeah. You know, and I, we had a situation up in... Uh, with not finishing the roads in a development in North Carver, and they want to give me. And the problem is, is the planning board keeps telling them they can give a bond or a surety, and then they meet with me and they're upset because. But I tell them, you know, I'm the treasurer, I require it, and they gave us $140,000 in cash. It's sitting in a, right. an account that we can use to draw upon, to do the final code on that road if we need to do it. But you know, when when you're in these positions, whether you're in Jack's position or you're on the Board of Selectmen, the question is not how many times you can raise your hand and say yes. The question is, are you tough enough to say no when no is the correct answer? And that's where that's where Jack comes from on on, on insisting that the, the bonds be done properly. That's where I come from in saying that project isn't right for CAVA. It isn't, it isn't properly zoned. It isn't properly financed. Uh, you, you see what happened to that when they first put it in. Mm -hmm. There was vandalism. Yes. The reason that the people of Carver didn't pay for that vandalism is that I insisted it be done as a turnkey project. That, that we just take a check for the savings and that somebody else does the management of it. If that had been owned by the town of Carver and operated by the town of Carver, that would have been a disaster for us. It would have taken time and efforts from Jack Hunter and, and everybody else that should have been working on development. It, 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 you have to get these things done right. And sometimes you have to be tough enough to say no. That's where I came from on the solar project on Route 44. It just wasn't financed properly. And, and back on uh, Great Meadow and the Purchase Street area, that, that was unconscionable what they did. And you're never going to really give them the financial assurance of the damage that was done to their lives. But, I mean, we need to check in there and make sure that, you know, because it's going forward one way or the other. I mean, we might be able to put a buffer in there or something. But we need to make sure that we're getting the money out of those solar panels and personal property taxes. With Ravenbrook, we gave them a deep discount because it was a Superfund site. We're going to get $75,000 a year for, on average, for 20 years. But that one up there, we should probably get several hundred thousand dollars a year. And if we're getting it, 
The town shouldn't profiteer from that. We should put some, set some money aside to give those people abatements for their homes. Mitigate the damage. Mitigate. That's been and done. I, I yeah. don't think you can ever do that. Yeah. You can't put a value on people's personal lives. Yeah. And you know, in, they grew up in Carver and they, they raised their families in Carver, and then Carver turns its back on them. Well, remember, rural character was the number one priority yes. until the solar project came along. And the rural character all of a sudden went to the bottom of the list, right, and right. the solar was moved in there. That's not right. Mm -hmm. your, your fundamental beliefs can't change just because something came along. And we need to get together with the assessors and make sure that they haven't gone out and done any sort of agreement with them because they should be taxed full and fair for all of that, not the deep discounts that we gave to Ravenbrook. And what disturbed me is that uh, your opponent was one of the uh, one of the key individuals at town meeting that. Uh, led the charge to water down that um, solar bylaw that we were trying to establish. <laughs> and then when this thing happened over here in uh, uh, Great Meadow, mm -hmm. you know, he, wouldn't, he hadn't even acknowledged those people for a year and a half that they were talking about this and trying to prevent it. And all of a sudden when it became an election issue, uh, he couldn't, he was doing backflips. He couldn't do enough to, to help them out at that point in time when it's too late, you know what I mean? Right. And as that progressed and they weren't going to build it, they were going to put a uh, development in there. And a lot of people, you know, they were looking forward to having new neighbors right. and stuff. They took their yeah, eye off they, the ball. They, they, they That's didn't right. turn against yeah. that. They said, hey, you yeah. know, this is good. And right Growth before the good. deadline yeah. in December 2012, that company just right. slid it right in there yeah. under the planning yeah. board. The planning board right. didn't challenge it at all. And but, it was but, Dick's motion that, that, that took the compromise, and, and I, use that, I use that term because it's important, the compromise on the overlay map that Bob Belvin put together. Mm -hmm. That was a compromise, and it was just thrown thrown away yeah. in favor of carte blanche give anybody that wants to put I I anywhere in town that's not right there are not enough protections in the uh, in, in the bylaw as, as, as written to protect people uh, when we needed to go slow and find out how it works why did you want to rush into something and you know something Paul you hit the nail on the head rural character was the the um, the theme that I've had thrown at me for the last 25 years here we want to preserve our rural character. And yet, like you said, when this solar stuff came along, now they want to put them everywhere. And that's taken priority over everything. Right. You know, I, I've always been a proponent of the, uh, proponent of the village districts. And I knew pretty much where the vi village districts were. And when they did the paddock bog, they, I knew right away that was in a village district. But the planning board didn't even consider that. They, they had to know it was in there. Either that, they didn't know what was going on. It really concerns you to think that right in the middle of our town, we're going to have this ugly solar thing in the middle of our town. Right. Once again, we also bring up the, uh, the, the fact that, you know, I, I don't think in, nobody in this town is against the growers. No. Absolutely not. This is about coexistence between the rural part of Carver and the residential part of Carver. It's it's about it's about separating land uses. If they have a, if they want to put solar on their farms for their own home, I don't have a problem with that. I don't think you have a problem with that. There's one up on Federal Furnace that right. they use for the, do their warehouses and everything else, and right. it's pretty attractive. It's up on top of a hill and everything. They should be allowed to do that. Right. But I, I think the average grower, and I I don't really know because I don't you know converse with them that much. But I you know if it. If it was that popular, there'd be a proliferation of them all over town. I think their main concern is the grow cranberries. Right. They're farmers. That's right. what they want to do. They don't want to get into any of this other stuff. You like know, you not, said, right, maybe just... And, and I'm not into rubbing salt in their wounds. I know that they've had, they, they've had a tough time. And, and they got some tax relief in the early 2000s. The residents of this town didn't. So we need now to allow somebody else to have their turn. And, and that's how I see it. I don't see it as, as taking something away from growers. That's not what I want to do. You know, what I want to do is allow the tax shifting that went on in early 2000s to start when, when, when business recovers. And we've seen a commercial, re a small commercial recovery in Kava. When we see that recovery going forward, the, the, the advantages are what's been a disadvantage for the residents on Prop 2.5 will then turn to their advantage. We need to allow that, that recovery to happen. I've talked to several different taxpayers that their parents or their grandparents were cranberry farmers, but you know, the, the kids aren't involved in it and they've passed on and the, the bogs aren't even uh, maintained anymore. And I told them, they're, most of them are out in the woods and stuff. You know, why don't you think of putting solar on it? You know, that will gain you some money. You know, as long as you should talk to, I haven't called Jack Hunter and talked to him. 
There aren't enough companies that are willing to do that. Well, you know, like Paul said, appropriately cited, where it doesn't yeah. impose upon the other residents yep. around it. I, I don't and, have an issue with right. that. And not yeah. only that is we'll get tax dollars out of it. Absolutely. We, we should be getting yeah. the full personal property tax dollar out of that. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, gentlemen, we've uh, had quite a good discussion here so far. Right. I think uh, we've been able to uh, get your, uh, your points of view and your vision out to the general public, hopefully. Um, what I would like to do in closing is um, commend the both of you on the campaigns that you've ran. Mm -hmm. uh, classy, kept your heads up, um, haven't responded to a lot of the negativism that's been bandied about out there, and I just want to congratulate you for that, and I think that uh, the citizens out there are probably taking notice of that. Um, you know, don't think that they're not aware of the things that go well, on around them, you know what I mean, for a minute. So, anything you'd like to say in closing, Paul? I, I think in, as I've gone around the town knocking on doors and, and meeting people, uh, I'm more committed to ever to the affordability aspects of running the town like a business, being pro-business, uh, finding a way to allow uh, cover, uh, appropriately sited businesses in appropriate zones to, so that we can recover the commercial sector of the town. We, not, we right now are collecting $100,000 less commercial taxes than we did in 2001. It's starting to go in the right direction. Let's keep it going in the right direction. Let's reach out to businesses. Let's uh, uh, try to run the town as efficiently as we can until the state aid starts to recover and the, there's a little bit more money in the coffers to spend. We'll spend it when we have it, and, and we'll spend it cost effectively when we have it. And let's move forward and, and, and try to pull everybody, everybody along at the same time. Thank you, Paul. And, you know, I've you know, always gone, made it a point to have an open door policy with all the taxpayers. Generally, when they come in to pay their taxes, I'll go out in the, out in the hallway and talk to them, how things go in the overriding messages. You know, uh, they pay too much in taxes, but they're not getting their money's worth. And so I try and respond by doing those things of, you know, printing the um, amount you need to pay for the 3% discount. And to give them, to cut their taxes, their interest in half. And then the recently, you know, I was the, the pusher in, in putting that uh, non-binding question on the ballot for reducing the CPA from 3% to 1%. Every five years you can do what you want to do. And I think by making it non-binding, we can get an idea of what people want to do and don't not do. So I'm listening to the taxpayers, you know, and I'm in the perfect spot to do that. So, um, and I'd like to continue to do that. I'd like to continue to, with the improvements, and I'd like to be able to get the help that I've requested. And maybe with Paul's uh, election onto the board, I'll have the opportunity to do that, although I understand you're a, a tough negotiator, but so. <laughs> That's good. That's they what gotta, we want. Yeah. They've they got to smile at everybody, <laughs> yeah. huh? Well, ladies and gentlemen, you've heard it here on Roundtable with Selectman Mike O'Donnell. I hope you'll join me on April 27th here at Cava High School. Come out and vote. Uh, the polls are open from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, your vote is important, trust me. Um, please come out and vote, and I hope you'll consider voting for these two candidates right here. Paul Johnson for Selectman, and Jack Franey for Treasurer Collector. Um, again, I want to remind you, um, please don't forget about the, uh, the victims of the Boston Marathon tragedy. Keep, the, uh, keep them and their families in your thoughts and prayers. God bless you, God bless the town of Kava, and God bless the United States of America. Thank you and good night. me tonight uh, several uh, stalwarts from our community um, who play very active roles in